Greetings, everybody. Today, we have a very important guest. Her name is Erica Demel. I will introduce her very shortly. My name is Dr. Gary Glassman. I am a endodontist. I'm an educator and uh, oral fitness expert. I have with me Erica Demel, and Erica is a registered respiratory therapist in Nova Scotia with over 16 years of experience in sleep medicine. And her main priority has been to help people recognize, understand, and treat their sleep disordered breathing, which is, and in her current role with the Snore Shop Atlantic, Erica's job is to educate physicians, healthcare professionals, organizations, and the general public about the consequences of poor sleep quality and what that can have on our general health. And of course, the importance of recognizing and treating sleep apnea and other forms of sleep disordered breathing. So Erica, welcome. Thank you. So nice to meet you. Great to meet you too. So yeah. Erica, I've got some I've got some questions for you with respect to sleep hygiene, respect to snoring. I'm a snorer. I wear an appliance. I tried the uh, the CPAP, high rate of failure. It didn't work for me, but now I have an oral appliance, and uh, it's working quite Excellent. well. And uh, so, if you could tell us, you know, what what is sleep hygiene, and and how is it related to to oral hygiene? So I think when people think hygiene, they immediately think of like cleanliness because most people are actively participating in some sort of dental hygiene program. <laughs> but when we talk about sleep hygiene, it's more about routines, which does obviously overlap with, with oral health routines, but it's about having a consistent bedtime, consistent wake time, um, being active through the day. So back to your fitness thing, making sure that you're outside, fresh air, just optimizing your overall health and then having these predictable, consistent routines in place so that your body knows when it's time to sleep, it sleeps hopefully well, and then you give yourself enough time in bed, you know, getting the seven to nine hours a night, making sure that your room is dark, free of distractions, reducing screen time, just all those activities and routines that you do in the evening, during the night, and when you wake up, that's kind of what we talk about with, with sleep hygiene. And, and what are the consequences when patients don't experience the quality of sleep that they need? Sleep's kind of a really, really important part of our health. Unfortunately, it's a part of our health that most people ignore. So we're a society that burns the candle at both ends. And it, letting your body rest and restore itself is vital to your physical health, but it's also really important for your mental health. So when you're sleeping, it's your body's opportunity to just rest. So your muscles and your cells repair, regenerate, your body does what it needs to do to kind of prepare for the next day. But when you're in your deep sleep, like your REM cycle, when you're dreaming, that's your brain's opportunity to restore itself. So it's a time when your brain takes all of the information that it achieved from the day and kind of puts it in the right spot in your head. So when you wake up, you've got a clear head, you can focus, you can concentrate, and it's really important for memory. So by cutting your sleep short or reducing your sleep quality, your body doesn't get a chance to kind of restore. So it can lead to laundry list of medical problems. Um, from a physical standpoint, it can lead to issues with like your cardiac health, uh, your immunity, and then mental health being a really big one. So your brain not getting that opportunity to rest that's where depression, anxiety, and those sorts of things can come into play. So it's really that, integral to your health. <laughs> that can all, those can all be consequences of not getting enough sleep. So how does one recognize, I mean, if you're alone and you're, you don't have a partner, how does one recognize when you are snoring or you have sleep apnea or you have one of the other, you know, sleep disorder readings? That's the tricky part because it happens in your sleep. So when for us in sleep medicine, it's one of the biggest challenges we've come across is trying to find people that have these conditions. Um, I think you mentioned, you know, sleep disorder breathing being pretty common. So about 6 million Canadians have sleep apnea and 80% are still undiagnosed. So as much as it sounds like it's prevalent, there's still people that aren't tested and treated. And a lot of that comes down to they don't know what's happening. So really, if somebody points out that you're snoring or you have witnessed apneas by somebody that's sleeping next to you, then they'll usually kind of encourage you to seek testing and treatment. But if you're alone, like you said, and you don't know that it's happening, 
it's usually something that continually occurs until you have some sort of physical manifestation of it. So it's usually once you start to have high blood pressure or you're so tired, you're falling asleep driving or you're seeking healthcare, you know, your healthcare provider trying to figure out why you have anxiety and depression, why it can't be managed. It all comes down to looking at sleep. So perhaps one of the first lines of defense, we'll call it, is when a when a patient, we'll call them a patient, person goes yeah. to their physician for an annual medical exam, or more commonly, when they go to the dentist every six months, if they're on a six-month program, Absolutely. to have a very simple questionnaire that may be part of every routine examination. And I believe that that questionnaire is called the stop bang. Is that what that's called? Yeah. I think it would probably be a great screening mechanism, especially for those that don't have a significant other that recognize it. And then, then we can, you know, move, move forward with, you know, if, if we obviously find that this person and identify them as a snore yeah. or have some sleep disorder breathing, then we can move forward with the next step. Yeah, actually having dental professional screening for it is key. I find more pe people are seeing their dentist or their dental team every six months and then they don't even see their doctor. Uh, for us on the East Coast, it's really difficult to get a family doctor in general. So people are actually seeing their dental team and their allied health professionals more than their own doctor. So what's great about dental, the dental group, is that they're able to see the person's airway. So if somebody has sleep apnea or snoring, it all stems from having a small throat. And then when you fall asleep and your body relaxes at night, the muscles in the throat relax too, and it causes the throat to get narrow. But going back to the screening, like sometimes you'll see it just in your routine exam, but if it's not ca caught there, the stop bang that you referred to, it's eight questions. And it's just, if you answer three or more, yes to three or more of the questions, then it puts you at a high risk of having sleep apnea. So the STOP, S-T-O-P, S stands for snoring. So do you snore? T stands for, are you tired? O is, has anybody observed you stop breathing? And P stands for pressure. So do you have, or are you being treated for high blood pressure? And then the bang part, B-A-N-G, B stands for BMI. Um, a lot of people don't know their BMI. There's calculators that are really easy. You can find access that stuff online pretty easily now. Uh, age, over 50. And would be neck circumference, another thing that a lot of people don't know. <laughs> but if you've ever bought a shirt, so especially for men, if you've ever bought a shirt, like what your neck size is, you can figure it out from there. And then G for gender. So it's more common in men to have sleep apnea. So if you answer yes to three or more of those, probably should get tested. So what's the sequence of events? I've done the stop bang, I've identified a patient, or I've identified myself as a mm -hmm. having a sleep disorder, breathing uh, issue. What's the next step? What do I do? Who do I seek for help? Do I go to my medical practitioner? Do I get a sleep study? Once that's done, where do we go? Depends on where you are because it varies greatly across Canada. But the short answer is you do need a sleep study. On the East Coast, individuals can actually just go and get a sleep test. They don't need a referral. But in certain provinces across the country, for example, Ontario and BC, you do need to see your medical provider in order to have a referral for a sleep test. The type of sleep test you do also varies depending on region. Some people do um, an overnight test where they stay in a lab overnight and they're wired up and they can look at every little detail of their sleep. Uh, some areas, mostly for me in Nova Scotia especially, most people just do a home sleep test where they just take home a very simple device, wear it overnight in the comfort of their own home, return it the next day, and then a report's generated and sent to their medical provider. Once you know what you're dealing with, you have to figure out how bad your sleep apnea is, and that should dictate what the treatment options might be. So if you do the test and it shows, you know what, you just snore, then it's trying to figure out where in your airway your narrowing is and what treatment might be most feasible for you. What are some of the challenges that you uh, that you face with patients to try to get them to practice, you know, good sleep, <laughs> sleep hygiene? Yeah, I mean, probably a lot of the same problems that you run into in your own practice, just trying to get people to develop routines. So creating those habits, creating those routines, our bodies like predictability, our, as humans, we're designed to be consistent with things. 
and our body thrives on that routine. So just working things into your routine, that's difficult for people who have shift work, for example, or, you know, they have small children, they're caring for an older parent. So, you know, social aspect of things sometimes makes it challenging for people to achieve good sleep hygiene. And then it's, it's the denial. So because a lot of these sleep disruptions occur when they're asleep, they don't know they're happening. So they just assume that being tired all through the day and all these medical conditions that they've got, you know, all of a sudden hitting them, it's a normal part of aging, which it, it, it is in a sense, but it doesn't mean that it can't be well managed so that you can achieve better health. And that's what it's all about. You know what? It's incredible. You know, when we, we talk about oral health and oral fitness and oral hygiene, yeah. you know, it's so important. What a lot of people do not realize is that oral health, whether it's the maintenance of your gums and your teeth uh, or maintenance of your airway in order to sleep better is all related to general health. Yeah. And quality of life. Of course, quality of life. That's important. That's Erica, thank you yeah. very, very much. You brought a lot of insight into this very, very important subject. And uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And um, we'll make sure that you uh, you get a great recording of this as well. So uh, signing <laughs> off, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend and uh, happy, uh, happy holidays. Thanks, you too. <laughs>